I want to shift a little bit towards um, preserving democracies now. So we talked a lot about representation and how best to do that and how things form. So I want to kind of understand how how we preserve the systems that we've created now. Um, and first, let's talk about corruption. Yeah, so so corruption is um, kind of there are a few people who like corruption, <laughs> even even in countries where corruption is very widespread. So it probably also people kind of engaging in in bribery and and, and these kinds of practices, uh, kind of where it's widespread. Corruption is uh, is probably one of the kind of least popular things uh, if you were to put it to a, to a vote. And this this is very marked uh, also when it comes to if you look at reasons that people who tend to conduct a coup or or otherwise dismantle democracy so reason that they that is often given is is often pointing to the corruption of the of the existing political class so this is a very typical rationale it's been very prominent motivations for example for for military coup plotters but also people who, who kind of who are elected as leaders and, and maybe uh, referred to as populist leaders who would like to kind of shape shape society uh, or politics in a way to benefit most people and and the corrupt uh, political elite is often often the uh, supposed enemy and so so it's indicative of of corruption being an issue with with democracies so this is very kind of fussy of course and the issue is that um, if i were a military uh, if i were a general plotting a coup i would certainly also point to corruption with political elites rather than than saying that I want to to have power for myself to to instate the policies I like. Uh, so that's an issue with it. But if you look at analysis uh, looking into the survival of democratic systems or or their ability to withstand degrading basically. So if you think of democracy as a continuous scale, what is it that makes certain democracies resilient to moving down on that scale? Whereas others seem to be much more fragile and 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 could be degraded and and slip very far down on the scale and eventually become kind of non democracies, let's call them dictatorships or or autocracies. And there are tons of of uh, statistical studies on on this, kind of looking across uh, all countries of the world, across kind of up to two hundred and twenty thirty years of of his, historical time looking into different things that might kind of make democracies le- more or less resilient. I've done an um, analysis myself with uh, alongside the co-authors where we looked into around 70 uh, measures that capture uh, different explanations for, for democratization or democratic breakdown in the literature. And then we tried to, to look into, well, okay, let's run all uh, kinds of combinations of, of statistical uh, models that that look into or combinations of these uh, explanations in, in in one statistical uh, statistical model using different democracy measures using different time periods and let's look at which of these factors that seem to be uh, robust across different statistical specifications and there are very few factors that tend to come out as as uh, very robust when it comes to explaining democratic breakdown or democratic decline. There are kind of theories and, and, and things that might plausibly explain it, but we have we don't have that many democracies breaking down, so it's really hard to say which ones are clearly related to democratic breakdown. Corruption is one of those factors. So economic the level of economic development as measured by, uh, by GDP per capita is one. Um, the rule of law kind of measures on on rule of law is, is another and, and corruption which is very related to rule of law um, is, is also one in addition comes uh, another one is, is the kind of the basically the length the democracy has been in place so, so kind of basically if you're uh, if you're an old democracy uh, you're much more likely to, to be consolidated in different regards kind of people have learned the uh, Kind of norms and experiences of, of, of how democracies work and, and kind of have expectations on how elections should be conducted, for example. So you can recognize um, when when people when people start saying that they won't uh, respect the um, the outcome of an election and you, and you have a long history of past, say, presidents expecting or, or accepting losing an election, then it becomes a very stark contrast, right? So, so these old democracies are more resilient and they can then more easily than a young democracy withstand those kinds of attacks on, on, on democracy. 
Um, so now I, I ventured a bit off uh, off topic uh, with an anecdote that this is probably recognizing in 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 Trump and um, um, U.S. presidential elections. But but to respond to the corruption uh, question, it seems to be very strongly correlated with uh, with democratic uh, decline, democratic backsliding, and and there are different different reasons for that. For this one is the delegitimization of of democracy within the population. And if you have a population that thinks that, well, democracy is a good idea, but the system is basically not working, so we'd rather have some alternative, we'd rather trust this, this general to take over, then the probability of a coup increases. I mean, so unpopular political systems, even if the population doesn't really, very seldomly goes out and overthrows democracy in a revolution, uh, but it, it increases the chances either of a military coup, which is kind of threat number, used to be the historical threat number one to, to democracies, or it increases the chances of, of what is currently the most pressing threat to democracy, namely elected leaders gradually undermining uh, the democratic system from within to consolidate power in his or her own hands. So basically, gradually manipulating elections, undermining freedom of the media, uh, civil society organizations in a manner such that kind of a few years down the road, the system, it's, it's completely impossible to get rid of the incumbent because he and it's typically he is, is is in such a powerful position that it is impossible to uh, to get rid of and this becomes much easier in in instances where um where the system is unpopular or for example when when there is a lot of corruption because there are fewer people who are actually then basically willing to to stand up and fight against uh, or fight fight for the for the democracy if there's complacency about the political system then it's it's easier to accept these kinds of Trespassing. So in America, we famously have our three branches of government when they're supposed to check each other. Yeah. So I guess why is that necessary to have different power structures checking each other versus just one group that we all elect and hey, that represents our our values and our perspective. And then I guess part of that is why is it always the executive that consolidates power? Yeah. No, I guess it's kind of if if you are in in the executive, if if you are the president or prime minister, you're basically day to day executing kind of a lot of important decisions. You have control over over power resources that can be related to to security forces or or just the ability to um, let's say take a policy decision decision on law from parliament and just implement it in the way that you that you want. So so basically, you, you have a lot of. In the parliament, there's also typically um, kind of 500 individuals or, or, or so several hundred individuals, and it's harder to, to kind of coordinate on, on, a, on a kind of collective autocratic rule in, in parliament. So that, that would be one, one response. But I think there's something particular to, to the executives, uh, kind of basically the powers that are concentrated with the executive relating to, to going, uh, going about implementing and shaping day-to-day day-to-day -day policy policy decisions and, and this also being kind of one one person typically at the pinnacle of, of power so that's um, collective dictatorships have have been tried as military juntas for example um, Napoleon Bonaparte led a kind of triumvirate in a dictatorship for for a short period of time but it, it basically ended with Napoleon kind of cooing the others and, and cons consolidating and concentrating power so I think there is also something to this power dynamic when when things start going off the rails it's it's really hard to sustain a collective dictatorship where, where 500 people need to kind of come together and agree and execute politics. There's there's one, well, it's not really an exception because there is often a leader there as well, but kind of in some regimes you see very uh, autocratic regimes, you see very kind of strong and institutionalized regime parties. So I would say that the, the Chinese Communist Party used to be that before kind of Xi Jinping has, has kind of concentrated a lot more power in his hands uh, recently. But you used to have much more of these features of collective dictatorships, but then you have a day-to-day -day standing kind of political party structure. So you're not just going around kind of writing and passing laws, but you actually have an apparatus for, for, for different different functions. Um, and what you often see in these autocracies, the, these dictatorships, is the fusing of the party and the state and also controlling the uh, legislature. Um, but I, I think, yeah, the executive, I mean, empirically, it, it's kind of the executive and, and more often than not, it's a president. And I think that also speaks to it's easier to get kind of a personalization of politics in systems that are presidential. 
So you very often have kind of campaigns um, are more often centered on people or kind of individuals rather than political parties and thereby often also ideas um, and, and policy proposals. And this also gives individuals their own more individualized support base than, than if you were to, if you have a, a parliamentary system. So, so in, in, in parliamentary systems uh, where you need to kind of win control over the parliament in order to, to win control over uh, the executive, uh, because there are kind of election campaigns about seats in parliament, they have more often become election campaigns about uh, parties and policy proposals. But that being said, there's there's been a long literature looking into uh, kind of what is called the perils of presidentialism. So whether or not presidential democracies are more likely to break down than parliamentary democracies. Uh, and there are mixed findings in that literature. So it's not entirely clear empirically that, that presidential systems are are doing much worse than parliamentary systems because you can have differences in how strong parliament is. So uh, differences in, in the strength of a Senate, for example, also within uh, presidential systems and, and, and between parliamentary systems as well. There can be differences in how the relative power balance between the executive and, and, and the legislature. And this kind of having a strong autonomous parliament seems to seems to matter, but it's not necessarily that the presidentialism, par uh, parliamentarism distinction is is um, it's not as clear in the in the data as I personally, for example, would expect from from theory and this notion that in presidential system you you more often you more often get the personalization of politics. Um,